Good afternoon. I'm Gregory Longini of the Chicago Transit Board, Office of the Secretary. We're about, we are about to begin the meetings for November 15th, 2022. On November 4th of this year, Office of the Secretary of the Chicago Transit Board issued a notice of change format of meetings of the committee, committees and the board scheduled for November 15th, 2022 due to COVID-19 pandemic. There is currently in effect a statewide disaster declaration 15, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been renewed from month to month since the start of the pandemic. Pursuant to Section 7E of the Open Meetings Act, virtual public meetings are permitted while the disaster proclamation remains in effect. Because of the governor's disaster proclamation remains in effect in the state of Illinois, the meetings on November 15th, 2022 are being held electronically or virtually for members of the public. Um, Chairman Silva, we can begin the Finance, Audit, and Budget Committee meeting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I would like to call to order the November 15, 2022 meeting of the Committee on Finance, Audit, and Budget. Will the Secretary call the roll? Yes, Director Lee. Present. Director Ortiz. Here. Director Miller. Here. Director Jakes. Here. Director Barkley. Here. Director Silva. Here. Director Zhao will not be here today. We have a quorum with six members of the committee present. You may proceed. Our first order of business is the approval of the committee minutes of October 14, 2022. I have a motion to approve. So move. Second. Moved, moved by Director Miller, seconded by Director Jakes. Uh, Director Lee? Yes. Director Ortiz? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Barkley? Yes. Chairman Silva? Yes. That motion is approved with six yes votes. Our next order of business is the finance report. Jeremy Fine. Good afternoon. I'm Jeremy Fine, and I'll present the, uh, the results for September. Uh, with regard to our system-generated uh, revenues for September, uh, we see Fairbox and past totals coming in $600,000 to the positive. Uh, we see fair, reduced fair subsidy coming in as expected, albeit lower than historic rates in previous years. non fair box totals coming in about $600,000 to the positive. Leave us for the month of September, positive by about $1.2 million on both an amended budget and original budget basis. On the next page, you see year-to-date uh, revenue numbers. Uh, and again, fair and past totals continue to be positive by 2.7 versus the amended budget and 2.1 versus the original budget. Reduced fair subsidy coming in as expected and non fair box totals coming in uh, better than budgeted by $4.4 million on both an amended budget and original budget basis. Uh, this leaves us for year to date uh, for system generated revenues, positive by $7.1 million uh, to the amended budget and uh, $6.5 million to the original budget but we're better than $50 million than where we were this time last year. With regard to our expenses, uh, we see uh, September expenses coming in uh, better than expected, uh, both to the amended and original budgets. Labor, we're positive by about $7.7 .7 million. Materials, about $600,000. And fuel and power, about half a million to 2 million on those respective lines. Injuries and damages coming in either uh, as expected or slightly uh, negative, uh, unfavorable to budget. And then other expenses due to the timing of some invoices uh, was negative by about $5 million, which leaves us for the month of September positive uh, to budget on the amended budget and original budget basis by $5.6 million. With regard to uh, year-to-date numbers, uh, we see... Uh, Year-to-date numbers following a similar type trend where we see positive favorability on most of the line items uh, with some small negative variance on materials. But overall, year-to-date, uh, we see a positive uh, variance on the amended budget uh, by $99 million and on the original budget by $132 million. So the positive variance that we see on our uh, revenues, system-generated revenues, coupled with the positive variance on expenses, uh, we'll now talk about the, uh, the public funding numbers and the positive variance that we see there. 
Uh, public funding for the month is coming in about $4.7 million to the positive on an amended budget basis and about $10.5 million on an original budget basis. Uh, with the bulk of that coming from sales tax and, and PTF, the public transportation fund positive variance, uh, with some small uh, offsets, uh, negative uh, offsets uh, from the RET collections for the month. We'll continue to keep an eye on this. Uh, some of that negative variance may be due to the way that we spread uh, the estimated revenues over the course of the year, uh, but it also may be an early indicator as to uh, softness in the larger uh, you know, real estate market, but we'll continue to keep the board apprised as we move forward. Uh, with regard to year-to-date numbers, uh, we see positive variance across all uh, line items here with a total uh, accumulated uh, positive variance on the amended budget of $29 million and $76.6 million to the original budget. So the, the three uh, streams that we talked about with regard to uh, the, uh, the system generated revenues, our expenses and our public funding have allowed us to draw down less in public uh, in, in federal relief funding than we had originally estimated. Uh, for this month, we're drawing down about $15 million. Uh, this accumulates up to about 41%, 41.4% of uh, the total allocation that's been drawn. This means that we have about 1.3 billion remaining. Uh, we'll talk about this in the next presentation about the 23 budget, but we estimate that by the end of the year, we'll still have about 1.2 billion remaining of federal relief funding, uh, and that should carry us through 2025. With regard to the three commodities that we purchased, fuel, power, and natural gas, uh, we're where we want to be locked in uh, for the foreseeable future on all three commodities. Uh, we'll look for selective opportunities to buy, uh, in particular, additional fuel purchases uh, so that we get up to the 75% of the expected uh, volume for those years uh, for 24 and 5. But again, uh, our uh, you know, dedicated approach of buying, uh, you know, when the market ebbs a little bit on uh, fuel has really allowed us to lock in at very favorable pricing levels. For 23, 4, and 5, we're locked in uh, for those uh, hedge positions right now at about the $2.80 to $2.90 range. Uh, so well below what you see uh, in the larger market. Uh, and again, this has worked out well for us. We'll continue to look uh, for selective purchases as we move forward. Uh, this concludes my report for September. Uh, glad to answer any questions. The public funding is going to take us till what year? So the uh, federal relief funding uh, should take us through uh, 2025 and into the uh, very early portion of 2026 based on current uh, projections. Um, so we're going to have 1.3 billion? Well, uh, we expect by the end of 2022 uh, to still have uh, 1.2 billion uh, remaining in federal relief funding. Currently, we have 1.3, uh, but based on the draws uh, through the remaining portion of the year, uh, and that, that extends into uh, 2023 because of the way that public funding comes in, uh, we expect to, again, have... Uh, about 1.2 billion remaining uh, at the end of 2022 uh, to cover short projected shortfalls for 23, four and five. Thank you. Chairman Barker, any questions? No questions. Um, Reverend Miller? No question. Um, Director Lee, Jakes or Ortiz, any questions for Jeremy? No question. No question. Great you. job, Jeremy, great job. Okay, thank you. Um, we may proceed to the next item, Chairman, number four. We're going to our next order of business is an ordinance amending ordinance number 021-119, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, this is Jeremy Fine, your Chief Financial Officer. I'm joined by Michelle Curran who's uh, Deputy CFO and Comptroller, and she'll walk through the uh, amendment here for the uh, capital program. Thank you, Jeremy. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Curran, Deputy CFO and Comptroller. I'm here today to present an, an amendment to the 2022 to 2026 Capital Improvement Program, or CIP. 
In November 2021, the board approved this $3.5 billion CIP, which was amended in March, June, and August, and we're now proposing a final closing amendment to incorporate additional known changes. First, FTA has awarded bus and bus facilities and low and no emission vehicle program funding of $28.8 million to CTA for a portion of the cost for, of acquiring e-buses and modernizing the Chicago bus garage to support and accelerate the bu electric bus fleet conversion. Second, CTA was awarded $5.6 million of congressionally directed spending for projects. Uh, the grant includes $2.1 million for elevator modernization throughout the system, $2 million for the 103rd Street Garage uh, bus electrification implementation project, and $1.5 million for the implementation of a workforce development plan for Red Line Extension. Third, the City of Chicago, through its Department of Planning and Development, has approved $37.2 million of TIF funding to contribute to four CTA capital improvement initiatives. These include $8 million for the Western Brown Line Station and Bus Turnaround, $5.7 million for California Blue Line Station Design, $2 million for the 43rd Street Station Improvements, and $21.6 million for Forest Park Branch Blue Line Track Renewal. Fourth, the Department of Homeland Security has awarded CTA $647,000 of fiscal year 2022 Transit Security Grant Program funds for the Chicago Police Department. Fifth, FTA has awarded Areas of Persistent Poverty uh, Program funds of $450,000 to CTA to develop a plan for locally led public engagement for the RLE project. Sixth, CMAP has awarded Section 5303 Unified uh, Work Program Planning Project Funds of $625,000 for staff to develop and refine CTA's capital program for inclusion into the five-year transportation improvement program. And finally, prior granted Rebuild Illinois 2020 transportation bond funds of $43.7 million are available to contribute funding for the new training and control center, the 43rd Street Green Line Station improvements, Forest Park Branch Track Renewal and Kedzie Bus Garage Building Exterior Work. The net increase in funding due to this amendment is 110.5 million, bringing the final 2022 to 2026 CIP to 3.8 billion. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. I don't have a question. Mr. Barkley? No question, no question. Our Director Ortiz, Lee or Jakes, any questions? No, questions. no questions. I, Thank you. No further questions, Chairman Silver. May I now have leave to place this item on the omnibus? So moved. Board. Okay. Second. Director Miller, second by Director Jakes. Um, Chairman, we may move to agenda items number five and six. Our next order of business are two ordinances an ordinance adopting a budget for calendar year 2023 and financial plan for calendar years 2024-25, and an ordinance approving the fiscal year 2023 capital improvement program. Jeremy. Thank you again. I'm Jeremy Fine, your chief financial officer. Uh, with regard to the 2023 operating budget, uh, as you'll see on the next page, uh, this is a $1.8 billion budget. Uh, it is anticipating using 390 million of federal uh, relief funds uh, to close the projected gap that is caused by the overhang of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that continues to impact public transportation. Uh, ridership is expected to grow 9.3% uh, compared to the 2022 forecast. And uh, to put it in perspective to 2019 levels, uh, ridership is expected to grow uh, from approximately 53% in 2022 uh, to 59% in 2023. Uh, the CTA received 2.2 billion of federal relief funding, uh, which will cover the projected gaps through 2025. Uh, the highlights of the budget include maintaining full service along with continuing past uh, price reductions, uh, fully in integrating the one, three and seven day passes with PACE, uh, continuing to explore partnerships with both uh, Metra and PACE uh, as we implemented the Regional Connect Pass in 2022. Uh, the really underpinnings and guideposts for the budget uh, were encapsulated in the Meeting the Moment Action Plan, 
which focuses on delivering reliable and consistent service, enhancing safety and security, improving the customer experience at our facilities, upgrading digital tools to improve communications with our customers, and investing in our employees. On the next page, we have an overview of the 2022 forecast. And stronger than public, uh, stronger public funding revenues and lower expenses have allowed us to extend the life of the federal relief funds. Uh, the 2022 forecast requires $258 million less of federal relief funding than originally budgeted. The higher system generated revenues of 6.2 million are driven by higher uh, fare box revenues and advertising revenues. Uh, public funding is forecasted at 103.8 million higher than budgeted, uh, which is driven by sales taxes uh, continuing to outperform expectations in part due to the expansion of the tax base to include online sales, as well as PTF being fully restored in 2021. Uh, and then the expenses are uh, estimated to be about 147.8 million less than budget uh, due to the positive variance on labor, fuel and power and contracts. Uh, 2022 forecasts include $197 million of federal relief funds, which again is substantially less than what we had originally estimated in our budget. On the next page, you see that the 2023 uh, operating budget is a fiscally prudent budget. Uh, we see uh, operating revenues uh, excluding federal relief funds are expected to increase by about 11.3% in 2023, uh, driven by system generated revenues, uh, you know, increasing by 6.7% uh, than the uh, 2022 budget, uh, which is driven from higher estimated ridership and related fare box revenues. Public funding marks, which are set by the RTA, are projected to be 121.6 million or about 13.2% higher than the prior year's budget. Uh, this is uh, public funding marks are set by the RTA are projected to be uh, you know, higher by because of the uh, the sales tax uh, revenues incorporating online sales, uh, the continuation of the full PTF receipts, uh, no online, no additional state cuts are also expected, and we also have recovery uh, ratio relief through 2023. Expenses are expected to increase by about 81 million dollars, or 4.6%. Uh, and this expense growth rate compared to the 2022 budget is less than the revenue uh, growth rate of 11.3% and also below uh, what you see in inflation uh, estimates out there in the current market. On the next page, uh, you see uh, the bar chart here uh, that represents uh, you know, the uh, estimated revenues and expenses uh, with the gaps in revenues highlighted in red on the left uh, hand, upper left hand corner of each set of bar charts. Again, the $1.2 billion of federal relief funding uh, will be used to balance the budget uh, from 2023 through 2025 by the remaining uh, federal relief funding that we have uh, that will close those $400 million or so gaps in each of those years. Total expense increases of 4.2 uh, and 3.7 for 2024 and 2025 are projected, and system generated revenue increases for 24 and 5 are estimated to be about 6.4%. Public funding marks will increase by about 2.8% for 24 and about 3.9 for 25. On the next page, uh, you see ridership uh, related information and really focusing on the fact that we anticipate ridership to increase by about 9.3% from 2022 levels. 2022 ridership is rebounding uh, and forecasted to finish the year about 23% higher than 2021's uh, levels. And the 2023 uh, ridership is expected to grow again by about 9.3% from 2022, or end up about 58% of 2019 levels. Uh, while the rate of rebound in the industry is slower than it, uh, originally anticipated due to the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, work from home policies and changing behaviors, again, the federal funding is a critical 
a component on allowing us to bridge uh, into higher ridership levels by utilizing those fundings as we showed on the prior pages. I'll now turn it over to uh, Michelle Curran to walk through the 2023 through 2027 capital improvement program. Thank you, Jeremy. Again, I'm Michelle Curran, Deputy CFO and Comptroller. Next slide, please. The 2023 to 2027 CIP is a $3.4 billion program that funds major projects, including the Redline Extension, the All Stations Accessibility Program, conversion to an electric bus fleet, and, bu and bus and rail fleet modernization. The funding sources for the CIP include federal funds, state PAYGO funds for motor fuel tax revenues, and CTA bonds. We will also continue to seek additional FTA discretionary grant funding awards as they become available particularly to accelerate the ASAP and BOSS electrification programs. And we'll also be requesting funding from the New Starts program uh, for the ROE project. Next slide, please. So the next several slides here include some of the details around specific projects in the CIP. First is the red line extension to the south, which is estimated to cost $3.6 billion. The red line extension would extend the rail line 5.6 miles from the 95th Street Terminal to 130th Street, including four new stations, park and ride facilities, and a storage yard and maintenance facility. We're currently in the project development phase and expect to enter into project engineering phase later this year. We also expect to request city council approval in December for a new TIF district to provide the local match funding for the project. Next slide, please. The All, St All Stations Accessibility Program, or ASAP, is a comprehensive 20-year program to make all stations vertically accessible. 103 of CTA's 145 stations, or 73%, are already accessible. Phase one of the plan, which is fully funded, includes nine more stations to be made fully accessible, including the four red line stations as part of RPM, the Austin Green Line Station, California, Montrose, and Racine stations on the Blue Line and the State and Lake Elevated Station. The 2023 to 2027 CIP includes funding for phase two of the program, including design for six stations for Irving Park, Belmont, Division, and Chicago on the Blue Line and Oak Park and Ridgeland on the Green Line. It also completes construction funding for Irving Park and Belmont and provides initial funding for Oak Park and Ridgeland. With the completion of these additional stations, the rail system will be 81% accessible. The program also includes upgrades or replacements of existing elevators. Next slide, please. The CIP includes funding of $257 million for conversion to electric buses. This will complete the funding need to modernize the Chicago Avenue garage for e-buses and begin funding for upgrades to the 103rd Street garage or to begin funding construction for a new garage. It also funds $142.5 million towards the next e-bus purchase. Including previously granted and awarded funds, CTA will have over $415 million invested in the conversion to bus electrification. Next slide, please. The CIP also invests in the bus and rail fleet modernization. Bus improvements include purchasing the remaining new standard buses, providing funding for new e-buses to replace the 4,000 series buses, and perform overhauls on existing buses. On the rail side, we funded the purchase of the new 7,000 series rail cars and overhaul work on the existing 5,000, 3,200, and 2,600 series rail cars. We also continue to invest in capital maintenance and equipment to target needs between overhaul cycles for both bus and rail cars. Next slide, please. Finally, while already funded and not included in the 2023 to 2027 CIP, the Red Purple Modernization Project is the largest project undertaken by CTA to date and phase one is well underway. RPM will improve capacity, travel time, ride quality and safety on one of CTA's highest ridership corridors. Phase one is $2.1 billion and includes three major components, the Red Purple Bypass Bridge, Lawrence, Argyle, Berwyn and Bryn Mawr stations, and a new signal system between Belmont and Howard stations. Phase one is expected to be completed in 2025 and future phases of RPM are in the planning stage. This concludes our presentation and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Chairman, any questions? 
Chairman Silva? Can you repeat, okay, the ridership, okay, that you projected, 9.3? Yes, so the, uh, the ridership uh, growth, uh, you know, we're expecting to increase uh, 9.3% from 2022 levels. And you're comfortable with the number, right? Yes, um, you know, I believe that this is an attainable number. Uh, you know, we're to kind of in per, to put it in perspective. Uh, you know, we're currently running on a on a day to day basis about that level. Uh, this is an annualized number, uh, so uh, you know, again, uh, we're we're heading into a a, a flu, COVID, RSV uh, season uh, that could have a negative impact on ridership. But again, I think that this is an achievable number as we move into 2023. Uh, hopefully we outperform this number, uh, but you know, again, from a budgeting standpoint, uh, you know, we believe that this is uh, that this is a, a an achievable number as we continue to move forward on regaining our ridership uh, post uh, COVID. Are you going to be focused? I, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? In, what are you going to be focused? Okay, to make the. Yeah, so uh, we continue, uh, you know, again, um, marketing the system as we uh, constantly do, partnering with different uh, events uh, as we have uh, throughout uh, the, the last several years, but uh, as we've ramped back up uh, in the post-COVID, uh, you know, kind of era, so to speak, uh, you know, we'll be continuing to look for those opportunities. We also have, uh, you know, been partnering uh, with the other service boards on Making sure that the uh, that the price point on the uh, passes are uh, you know appropriate and like I mentioned in the in the prepared remarks uh, as part of the 23 budget uh, you know we're looking to uh, fully integrate the one three and seven day passes uh, with uh, CTA and Pace uh, we did we rolled out the regional connect pass uh, you know in 2022. Uh, you know, where we're able to meet, uh, have more seamless inter uh, connectivity between uh, CTA, Pace, and Metra, uh, and that is uh, those those different things have inspired that we've done in the past have inspired additional ridership uh, through 2022. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think that this uh, further integration, further marketing, uh, and further getting people back into uh, kind of a regular routine uh, will. Uh, it, it, inspire additional ridership. Again, the, the meeting the moment action plan really is all geared around all of these factors, uh, you know, making sure that uh, that the system is uh, is convenient and, con and, and delivering consistent service, uh, you know, increasing focus on safety and security, uh, increasing the customer amenities and allowing people to be able to understand when the trains are coming uh, through technological improvements, uh, you know, and, uh, and focusing on our workforce, again, will hopefully uh, continue to drive the increased ridership that we've seen to date uh, and, and continuing to drive us forward on uh, regaining and attaining uh, not only 2019 levels, but, uh, you know, uh, levels in excess of that that will help us uh, drive additional revenues and close those budget gaps, uh, as we talked about in the presentation. Thank you. Keep it up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before, before we leave that topic, let me just amplify a little bit more of what Jeremy was saying. I, I I agree completely with what everything Jeremy said, that really our meeting the moment plan is really focused on exactly that issue. How do we get our ridership back? How do we get our customers back on CTA? And certainly that covers a, a broad swath of activities that we're going to be engaging in. Um, the other focus that I would, would, would mention is that we're also going to be looking at our bus service in a much broader way. Um, uh, looking at ridership patterns, looking at where people are going, where where they want to go, and how does our bus service align with that uh, to determine if there are things we should be doing with the way in which we provide our service that can ultimately also provide additional ridership gains for CTA. Um, to some degree, a lot of what we, we do will still be dependent upon what's happening with the city as a whole. Um, Jeremy's comments about a second wave of COVID or other issues in the winter will obviously could have an impact on CTA, as does in a in more indirect way, what's going on with Metro and Pace and their ridership. Um, the transferability between our systems is obviously something that we're improving 
Um, but to some degree, uh, we're also hopeful that they will start to see ridership gains as well, which will result in, in transferable ridership to CTA. So um, I think there's a CTA focus part of this. There's also a regional focus part of this that's going to ultimately result in us getting back to a much more healthier level in ridership than where we're at today. And, and hopefully, uh, as Jeremy indicated, we've seen continuous growth over this year. Uh, we're optimistic that we'll continue to see continuous growth over next year uh, and then see where we are, particularly as we're heading in to the years, you know, the final couple of years of having the, the federal funding that's allowed us to basically to continue to operate with our ridership level being much lower than we normally would have. Good. Thanks very much. Chairman Barkley? No questions. Uh, Director Miller? No question. Uh, Director Jakes? No questions. Uh, Director Ortiz? No questions, thank you. Uh, Director Lee? No questions. Uh, Chairman Silver, there are no further questions or issues on this matter. What, number seven? You need to put these two ordinances on the omnibus, sir. We just need leave to place these two items, agenda item number five and agenda item number six on the omnibus for board approval. That's all. Seven, six. Okay. May I now have leave to place these two items on the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Second. Uh, moved by Director Miller, seconded by Director Jakes. Uh, sir, we can go to agenda item number seven now. Our next, next order of business is an amendment to license agreement with mobile cubes. Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jeremy Fine, your Chief Financial Officer. And today I'll present for your consideration an amendment to the license agreement with Mobile Cubes LLC. Uh, the license agreement, which was approved by the board in February of 2019, authorizes Mobile Cubes to install, operate, and maintain mobile charging vending machines at designated rail stations on CTA property. The current agreement with Mobile Cubes does not allow for advertising on the kiosks but Mobile Cubes is launching a new and improved kiosk that does include advertising. The proposed amendment gives Mobile Cubes the authority to sell advertising on these kiosks and provide CTA uh, with 20% of the advertising revenues from the kiosk in addition to the 20% of, of rent, uh, rental revenues currently received. In addition, the amendment gives CTA the option to offer free or discounted uh, rentals on a promotional basis. The Mobile Cubes is working together with Intersection, CTA's advertising vendor, to sell advertising on the kiosks. Intersection, which has exclusive rights to sell advertising in CTA stations, has acknowledged the amendment uh, agreement uh, between Mobile Cubes and CTA that grants Mobile Cubes this limited right to sell advertising in CTA stations on the kiosks. The new Mobile uh, Cube kiosks feature a more user friendly interface and slimmer design, as well as improved connectivity longer lasting batteries that are universally compatible with different phone types and the ability for customers to rent or purchase a battery through an app on their phone for a contactless experience. Uh, the initial term of the license agreement was for three years with two one-year options to extend. Mobile Cubes and the CTA exercised the first one-year option in February of 2022. And the current agreement will expire in February of 2023 at which time CTA and Mobile Cubes may choose to execute the second and final option on the agreement. Uh, this, this concludes my uh, uh, formal remarks, and I'm glad to answer any questions that you may have. I don't have a question. Questions, uh, Jim Barker? So, so where are the current locations of the kiosks? So we have, uh, you know, about 70 locations throughout the system. Uh, they are geographically dispersed throughout the system. Uh, and we can get you a, uh, a full list of the, uh, the locations uh, through Greg. And, and would the, uh, is the contractor looking at expanding or keeping the 70, just the 70? Yes, uh, you know, we will look for opportunities to continue to expand the footprint, uh, particularly now with the additional uh, revenues that could come online for the advertising, as well as just uh, the, the service that it provides uh, to our customers. Uh, we'll continue to look for opportunities. Obviously, we're in some stations we're uh, constricted by just the amount of real estate, but we'll look for selective opportunities to continue to roll this program out. It's been successful for us, and we we anticipate it being more successful uh, with the additional advertising space and the revenues that it should create. 
Thank you. Dr. Miller? No question. Directors Lee Ortiz Jakes, any questions? No questions. All right, uh, Chairman, there are no further questions on this matter. I now have leave to place this item on the omnibus for board approval. So moved. Second. Dr. Miller, second by Director Jakes. Uh, we can, number eight, sir. Our next order of business is an ordinance authorizing a sublease to our ex HST manager, LLC, Bill Mooney. Good afternoon, Bill Mooney, your Chief Infrastructure Officer. Real Estate staff recommends approval of an ordinance authorizing a sublease to RX HST Manager, LLC, of a portion of property located at 120 North Racine Avenue. Sterling Racine LLC is a master lease agreement for 84,879 square feet on the first and second floors of 120 North Racine. The proposed new sublease is for approximately 7,786 square feet on the second floor. Sterling Racine will continue to be responsible for all rent and expenses as set forth in the master lease agreement, including its proportionate share of building operating expenses and all applicable taxes and utility fees. Under the terms of the master lease agreement with Sterling Racine, all amendments of the sublease require CTA approval, which cannot reasonably be withheld. I'm happy to take any questions on this item. Any questions? No questions. No questions. Uh, there's no further question. There's no questions on this matter, Chairman Silver. And I have leave to place this item on the omnibus for poor approval. So moved. Second. Moved by Director Miller, second by Director Jakes. We can go to number nine, sir. Our next order of business is the review of an ordinance authorizing a license agreement with Rush University Medical Center, Bill Mooney. Uh, Bill Mooney, your Chief Infrastructure Officer again. Real estate staff recommends approval of an ordinance authorizing a license agreement with Rush University Medical Center for property located at 301 to 339 South Damon Avenue. CTA is in the process of starting phase one of the Blue Line Congress Branch Improvement Project, which requires significant vacant land adjacent to the project for the staging of construction materials and equipment. CTA has identified 118,000 square feet of vacant property located at 301 to 339 South Damon in Chicago to be used for the project. Rush University Medical Center owns the property, which is the former site of Malcolm X Community College. Rush and CTA have agreed to terms for a license of the property for 175,000 per year for a, two, a term of two years with an option to extend for an additional year. Mutual indemnification and either party may terminate the agreement upon 60 days notice. The agreement also contains an environmental indemnification clause, which requires CTA to indemnify Rush with respect to the discharge of emissions of any contaminants on the property. I'll be happy to take any questions on this issue. Has the has it been signed already? Uh, yes, the, the track project is actually in procurement right now. And all things being equal, hopefully you'll be considering that item next month. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, no question. Any questions from any board members? There's no question, Chairman Silva. Our next order of business is set. Chairman, I think we need we need to place this on the omnibus for for board approval. Our next order of business. Yeah, is let me, we just need to place um, that we agenda item number agenda item. Yeah. On the omnibus for board approval number the one that Bill just mentioned the rush license agreement. Okay. Uh, can we have a motion for that? Yeah. I'll move. Second. And second. Now we now we may proceed to number ten, sir. Okay. Our next order of business is an ordinance authorizing an anti intergovernmental agreement with the city of Chicago to receive transit tax increment financing revenues for the red line station project. Mike. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Connolly, your chief planning officer. The ordinance before you today would authorize an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Chicago for CTA to receive $959 million of transit tax increment financing revenues and would authorize the implementation of various elements of the plan of finance for the Red Line extension. As you are aware, the Red Line extension will be a 5.6 mile rail extension south from the current terminal at 95th Street all the way to 134th Street. This project includes four new stations, 
and a new rail storage yard and maintenance shop. The expected project cost is $3.6 billion. CTA expects to receive a full funding grant agreement from the Federal Transit Administration for $2.16 billion. We anticipate a congestion mitigation and air quality grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation for $130 million. The CTA funding is currently set for $360 million in the approved CIP. Approval of this ordinance before you today will enable CTA to secure city funds to provide $959 million or 26% of the total project costs. The local funds provide a 40% local match required to obtain the federal grant funds of over $2 billion. Simply expressed, this ordinance would authorize CTA to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Chicago, which will allow the city to collect revenues from the transit tax increment financing district and distribute those funds to CTA to use for this project. The IGA includes terms relative to oversight, to reporting, reimbursement details, eligibility of various costs, as well as DBE and workforce goals for this massive project. This transformational equity project will extend rail service to the far south side of Chicago. It will reduce commute times for the south side residents and will greatly improve mobility and accessibility for transit dependent folks in this area. The Chicago City Council will consider the introduction of the transit TIF ordinance by the city's Department of Planning and Economic Development at their meeting tomorrow. The TIF ordinance would be considered for formal adoption at the December City Council meeting. Staff are recommending approval of this ordinance to enter into the transit TIF IGA with the city and to execute the associated documents necessary to implement this agreement. Thank you, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, the documents already gone through legal and, and, and all the parts, it's just signing? Uh, yes, this has been reviewed by both CTA's uh, legal department and the city's legal department. Thank you. So it's just signatures? Yes. Well, it, it's just signatures and city council needs to pass. Oh, city council. It's approved. Yeah approving the TIF, but but uh, if city council does just make that decision and the and the ordinance is going to be presented at the city council meeting tomorrow, um, then we would expect the city council to take up that ordinance for consideration at their December uh, city council meeting. And if that is if it, if it is approved at that meeting, then we would be prepared to enter into the IGA. But you're comfortable that it's gonna go through? You don't know. <laughs> if I if I could predict what city council, if, I'd probably be uh, I wouldn't be sitting here as CTA president. But uh, um, I know that that um, uh, we have been spending a lot of time talking to the aldermen about this project. Uh, we certainly have been making the case for why this is a project that that needs to be done. Uh, it needs to be done now. Um, the mayor believes very strongly in this project. The community, uh, which has been waiting way too long for this project to happen, are definitely uh, excited about the possibility of this project coming to fruition. And so uh, I am, am very hopeful that that city council will, will take the appropriate action in December and allow us to move this, this transformational project uh, for this community forward. Thank you. Thank you. I have no question. I, I have a, a comment. I'm, I'm excited about this. Uh, it yeah. represents a milestone in us moving forward uh, in this long awaited project. This community has waited a long time, and this is what we call, you know, filling the gap in an area that heavily relies on transit that has been, there's been a void for many, many years. So this is a, a big step uh, moving towards that, that uh, some equity there, and I'm excited about it. And uh, I'm looking forward to the city council receiving the ordinance uh, and, and, and signing off. Uh, if not uh, in December, you said likely it'll be presented for, for a vote there. But this is a big step and I'm excited about us moving forward. So I want to congratulate you, Dorval, and your team for, for working together. I know that there was some 
issues with the TIF and some of the council members had some concerns, but you know, you were able to alleviate some of those concerns so we can move this forward. So congratulations and, and we're really excited about moving this process forward. Ever Miller. Ditto, thanks. Any other questions on this item? Uh, Chairman, so there's no further questions on this item. May I now have leave to place this item with the only for board approval? So moved. Second. Well, that item number 10 has been moved and seconded by Directors Miller and Director Jakes. But before we proceed, um, we need to remove agenda item number nine from the omnibus. There's going to be an abstention on that. Um, made a mistake when we put it on there. So, Ken, I would recommend that we just ask leave to remove item number, agenda item number nine from the omnibus. Agreed. Okay. So we just, okay. We just need leave for that. Director Miller? So moved. Director Second. Jakes? Second. All right. Leave, leave was uh, moved by Director Miller, second by Director Jakes to remove agenda item number nine from the omnibus. Now we can move on to agenda item number 11. Chairman Silva. Yes. Uh, our next order of business is an ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with METRA. Mike Connolly. Yes, good afternoon again. I'm Mike Connolly, your chief planning officer. This ordinance would authorize an intergovernmental agreement between CTA and METRA for CTA to provide shuttle bus service during planned short-term service disruptions caused by METRA construction projects within the CTA service area. Under this proposal, when METRA has a short service disruption, CTA would provide public transit service to bridge the gap in the METRA service along their lines. CTA will ensure that these types of shuttles do not impede the normal CTA service operation, and CTA can always decline to provide any service requested by METRA under this IGA. These are not anticipated to be significant, but CTA cooperation with our sister agency is a good example of regional agency cooperation to serve public transit riders. This IGA has a proposed 10-year term, and the reimbursement rates for the service that CTA would provide to METRA will be determined for any proposed service at the time of the request, utilizing full CTA costs at the time. Staff are recommending approval of this ordinance to enter into an IGA with METRA for shuttle bus services. Thank you, I'd be glad to try to answer any questions that you might have on this ordinance. I don't have a question. Questions? No question. Any questions from the, any board member on this item? There are no questions, Chairman Silva. May I now have leave to place this item on the omnibus for approval? So moved. Second. Moved by Director Miller, seconded by Director Jakes. We can now go to agenda item number 12. Our next order of business is an ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Chicago through his Department of Family and Support Services, Tom McCone. Good afternoon, uh, Tom McCone, Chief Administrative Officer. As part of CTA's Meeting the Moment plan, we committed to focus on, on assisting people experiencing homelessness, mental health crisis, and drug abuse on our system. To help achieve this goal, last month, you authorized staff to negotiate an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Chicago's Department of Family and Support Services to fund additional social service outreach on our system. Chicago's Department of Family and Support Services maintains contracts with various delegate agencies to provide services to those experiencing homelessness, along with mental health and substance abuse support. This $2 million agreement will fund additional services through the end of 2023. This agreement expands the number of outreach workers on the CTA who are focused on helping individuals receive the appropriate support at facilities outside of the CTA. The goal of this outreach is not only to engage individuals residing on the system, but to bring them to the appropriate support services, including shelter, so they are not using the CTA as a shelter of last resort. I'm happy to answer any questions. Chairman Silva, any questions? I don't have a question. Uh, Chairman Barkley. Uh, um, Tom, how do we measure the success of this? And, um, you know, how much information are you going to give us by way of update uh, over the course of the next year? 
Yeah, so we have written into the, to the IGA, and subsequently it's in the, the delegate agency agreements, um, a set of metrics, KPIs, um, and reports that, that we'll get from the various delegate agencies. Um, and some of these they're, they're already using because they're already performing outreach throughout the city, but um, they're measured first and foremost around engagement, um, such as how many people did you, did, you, did you talk to, did you attempt to engage? And then um, how many people did you successfully enroll in services? Um, there is a, a tracking system um, that they use to, uh, to track individuals and then their sort of um, completion of getting su support services. Um, we have um, also written into the agreement um, a series of regular updates with each of the agencies and also DFSS since they're the contracting agency to make sure that we're uh, working directly with the agencies um, to get those reports, to get those updates um, on, the, uh, on the work that they're doing, the success of the work that they're doing, um, and then also any adjustments that need to, need to be made um, with the program. Uh, regarding the board, we're happy to report back to the board um, on a regular basis um, regarding those those measures and metrics um, and other indicators that we have from, uh, from, from the program um, and can provide that information directly to the board. Thank you. I'd like to see that because this is a, a big concern of many of our riders that, you know, there's just a lot of people out there that are suffering um, homelessness and through illness on our trains. And uh, certainly, you know, I share with President Carter that you know, you guys are transportation professionals. We understand that now you into the social service business and um, believe, please that the city is, uh, is stepping up to the plate to fulfill that role, that department. But uh, we wanna know how this is, is going because we get a lot of complaints about people who uh, create some concerns for our, our riders and their experience uh, while on the train. Yeah, thank you. And, and as I mentioned in my remarks um, last month, this is this is a national issue and, and we're working closely with our peers across the country too, so that we can all learn from each other and, and tackle best practices as, as everybody has, has had to, um, you know, dip their toes and step into um, providing these services because of the impact it's having on, on public transit around the country. Thank you. Thank you, so needful, no question. Uh, Director Ortiz, any? Director Ortiz, Director Lee. No question, thank you. Okay. No questions. Uh, Director Jakes. No questions. Um, there's no more further questions on this matter, Ch Chairman Silva. May I now have leave to place this item on the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Second. Moved by Director Miller, seconded by Director Jakes. We can now move to the contracts, uh, starting with B1. Next order of business is the review of contract number B1, a roofing contract. Any questions? Can you explain what the roofing contract is? Ellen? I'm glad to step in on this too. Is This is um, our vendor who inspects and maintains the roofs of our facilities. Um, so, uh, Director, we have over 100 facilities that have uh, fitness roofs on them that require regular inspection and maintenance to ensure that the um, equipment and personnel inside them are protected. Okay. Most authority wide, uh, Chairman. Any other questions on this item? No? We may proceed to E1 then, Chairman. Our next order of business is the review of contract number E1, a printing contract. We know print, printing contract. Do you have a question on it, Chairman Silva? No, I don't. Any questions from my board members? No questions. Nope. Um, we can now move on to F1, Chairman. Our next order of business is the review of contract number F1, an administrative contract. What is the administrative contract? So this is, um, Chairman, this is for the procurement of Bonfire which is a software that purchasing uses to host our procurements online. We transferred um, from a paper-driven um, process to an electronic one during, during COVID, and we've continued to use it. It's worked out really well for um, 
for our vendor base. Um, they don't have to come into the office to drop off their proposals. They're able to do it electronically. The, we had originally piggybacked off the MWRD and that contract is to, to expire in December. So we're now asking permission to contract off the state contract with SHI International Corporation. And through this contract, we will procure the bonfire software so that we can keep um, our process online. Are we fulfilling the DB, D, DB rule? I mean, Mr. Chairman, this is this is a, sir, uh, a software contract subscription to this, so there are no subcontracting opportunities. But as Ellen said, having this process online through Bonfire has greatly assisted us in getting the, the word out to DBEs about our contracting opportunities and making them more accessible. So again, they don't have to come into the office to pick up or drop off their bids when they're bidding uh, on a contract. They can easily see them from their offices and says, since DBEs have limited staff, um, this has greatly increased the accessibility of our bids to DBEs. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't. Chairman Silver, we may proceed to G1 through G3. Final order of business review of contract numbers G1 through G3 technology contracts. Any questions? Um, there's no questions, Chairman Silver. But contract number G2 will not be included in the omnibus and will require a separate vote, just so we remember that. There are no further questions on the contracts. May I have leave to place all the contracts except contract number G2 on the, on the omnibus for board approval? So moved. Second. Uh, that motion is moved by Director Miller, seconded by um, Director Jakes. So we may. Proceed to 13B. May I have a motion to approve the omnibus and recommend the omnibus for poor approval? So moved. Second. That motion is moved by Director Miller, directed, seconded by Director Jakes, and includes all the items on the agenda except the rush license and contract G2. I'll now take the vote. Um, Director Lee? Yes. Director Ortiz? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Uh, Director Miller? Yes. Uh, Director Barkley? Yes. Chairman Silva? Yes. That motion to approve the omnibus passes with six yes votes. We can now move to agenda item number nine. I now have a motion to approve committee. Okay, that's correct. Committee agenda item number nine, the license agreement with Rush University Medical Center. I recommend board approval. So moved. Second. Moved by Director Miller, seconded by Director Jakes. Director Lee? Yes. Director Ortiz? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Um, Director Barkley? Yes. Chairman Silva? Ab abstain. Uh, that motion is approved with five yes votes and one abstention. So we can now proceed to contract G2. May I now have a motion to approve contract G2, the Carasoft technology contract and recommend board approval? So moved. Second. Moved by Director Miller, second by Director Jakes. Director Lee? Yes. Director Ortiz? Yes. Uh, Director Jakes? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Uh, Director Barkley? Yes. Chairman Silva? Yes. That motion is approved with six yes votes. Uh, we would have had an abstention, except Mr. Jaw is not here today. So we can now proceed to item number 14. Chairman. Finally, may I, may I now have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. By Director Miller, second by Director Jakes. Uh, Director Lee? Yes. Director Ortiz? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Uh, Director Barkley? Yes. Chairman um, Silva? Yes. That motion is approved. The six yes votes were adjourned, and we need a few minutes of a break here to bring in the people for public comment.
Uh, good afternoon. We are ready to begin the regular scheduled meeting of the Chicago Transit Board for November. Uh, Chairman Buckley. Good afternoon. I would like to call to order the regularly scheduled meeting of the Chicago Transit Board for November 15, 2022. Would the Secretary call the roll, please? That's Director Lee. Here. Director Ortiz. Here. Director Jakes. Here. Director Miller. Here. Director Silva. Here. Chairman Barkley. Here. Uh, we have a quorum with uh, Director Ja is not here today. We have a quorum with six members of the board present. Our first order of business is public comment, Greg. Yes, uh, we have four public comment speakers today. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder to the speakers to please talk in a natural voice at a normal rate. And if you could limit yourself to three minutes, um, that would be uh, great. We will start with Eric Slater. Eric? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Nearly every month, we become aware of one of our coworkers who was assaulted while at work as a frontline transit worker for CTA and PACE. This vastly undercounts the nearly daily verbal assaults and threats each of us face. Squeezing more out of current workers makes things worse. Instead, we need to expand public transportation to the communities that need it most, rehire the many hundreds of unjustly fired workers, and open up good union jobs for thousands of working people. Instead, your transit plan continues to try to squeeze us by increasing headway and overpacking or ghosting buses and trains. This aims more frustration of passengers towards us as frontline workers. Your transit plan falsely claims that there aren't enough transit workers or people willing to do this work. Firstly, this is caused because management treats workers so poorly. Additionally, public transit is being deliberately abandoned in order to defund it and claim that nobody is riding it and thereby justify further defunding it. In addition to privatization, this is what these kinds of budgets have done to many of our needed public services, including schools, parks, healthcare, et cetera. Does public transit really need long unpaid swing shifts? It didn't need it 30 to 70 years ago. Do the people of Chicago region really need managers and private investigators and whole floors of lawyers going after workers for simply trying to get an unpaid day off from the extreme stress and danger of our work? What many passengers do not yet know is the hidden war against transit workers by appointed managers, administrators, and lawyers. They treat us like children or criminals. There is no legitimate reason to organize the work along these dangerous and antagonistic lines. In my 17 years as a CTA bus operator and eight years in the trenches defending my coworkers as their elected union shop steward, I have found that almost all of the punishment your appointed managers and labor relations departments meet out against my coworkers has nothing to do with the safe, with safe and courteous operations. Almost all of it relates to attempts at intimidation and short-term cost-cutting measures that actually cost the people of Chicago much, much more. For us workers and retirees, it tears apart our bodies. It causes so much unneeded stress. It does not need to be this way. The people of Chicago need to look to the workers. We are leaders of families and communities. We know the streets. We know the people. We are very good at what we do. We are the experts of public transportation. Workers and passengers should be making much more of these decisions, including these transit plans and even who, who leads these organizations. After some victories building our confidence in citywide coordination, the role of the frontline transit worker can begin to return to the natural leader in the population. Much of the violence currently directed against us can thus be turned into positive struggle to improve millions of working people's and students' lives. Give workers the space and respect to do this needed work. Through greater worker leadership and control, public transit in the Chicago region can become a positive example to the world. I yield my time to the next speaker. Um, thank you, Mr. Slater. Our next speaker is Mika Fiedler. Mr. Fiedler. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Micah Fiedler. And first off, I would like to thank the CTA board for the wisdom they bring to an organization that supports me and 1 million riders each day. Your combined 10 years of transit experience are invaluable in deciding who is to lead Chicago's buses and trains into the future. Yes, your 1.4 years average show in how you've tactfully governed through this three year long service crisis. Look, I understand that transit government, uh, governance is more than stations and routes. It requires expertise from all fields. 
it requires business people and an enterprise specialist to fail to fill the 25% operator deficit. It takes disability advocates to understand the health impact of getting ghosted in the Chicago winter since the tracking app isn't fixed. It requires clergy. And it requires lawyers to remember that the CTA board is required by Illinois Statute 3605-46 to appoint and meet quarterly with the Citizens Advisory Board. The Citizens Advisory Board is not the solution to this expertise gap, but it will tell you that leadership has and is failing to address the service crisis. It will tell you that it's independently tracked buses and trains and has actionable data for you. It'll give you staffing resources and advise you on minimum service requirements. And it'll remind you that at its core, transit service is the people. I give this comment sitting in a hospital parking lot after a non-urgent checkup. Shivering next to me are nurses and patients, braving the cold to save lives and suffering while preserving their own. Thanks to your expertise, none of us know when we could get here and none of us know that we're getting home. Let that sit with you while we wait. Thank you, and I yield my time. Uh, hello? Mr. Gettler, hello? please stand by. Please stand by. Okay. Greg, can you unmute the boardroom? No wonder. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Gallagher, you, uh, you can address the board now. Uh, thank you. Sure. Chairman Barkley, members of the Chicago Transit Board. My name is Kay Fabio Gitli here. I'm an avid Chicago transit writer and organizer of commuter stake action. Today, I would like to address you, the board specifically. Over the past few years, the CTA has been failing its riders. Thousands of Chicagoans are late to their work, appointments, or to meet their family every day because they cannot rely on their transit system. Passengers are rightfully outraged by the incompetence of the CTA executives. As a regular virtual attendee of the board meetings, I see a board that doesn't share the concerns of the public. I see a board that gives full trust to President Carter's leadership when this trust is not deserved. I see a board that is complacent and unequivocally supports leadership, CTA leadership's failed policies. I see a board that always praises President Carter, calls him a, quote, rock star, with an unprecedented 33% salary raise as frontline CTA workers continue to suffer. I see a board that is satisfied with meeting the moment plans despite no improvements being made. Last month, CTA unveiled their new L timetables, which promised to, quote, adjust scheduled service to better align with available workforce, end quote. However, about 30% of scheduled trains continue to be canceled. Last weekend on the Blue Line, only 43% of the scheduled trains went out to serve its riders. The leadership is all talk, but no action. Improvements are promised, flashy press releases are made, but the reality continues to be vastly different. PTA spokesperson Brian Steele is always eager to get on the defensive and point out that other transit agencies are experiencing the same issue. Sure, the labor market is challenging across the country. However, other agencies are actually able to communicate about their service with honesty. After Los Angeles Metro realigned their schedules in February 2022, the trip cancellation rates are now below 5%. We gotta ask why, two years into the pandemic, haven't been, uh, we been able to achieve the same? It is time to treat public transit as an essential service. If your tap water or electricity wasn't working 50% of the time, or if there was no way to know whether there would be any gasoline available at your nearest gas station, would we allow that to happen? I am disappointed by the lack of urgency the board has placed on this public issue. I would also like to point out that the Chicago Transit Board is required by the Metropolitan Transit Authority Act to establish a citizens advisory board consisting of 11 members and to meet quarterly. To my knowledge, the citizens advisory board has not been active for several years. Now, more than ever, Chicago needs this board to give the public their voice. I hope it can be restored as quickly as possible. In conclusion, I urge the board to carry out their duties to the people of Chicago and Illinois you have all been appointed to ensure that citizens receive quality public transit that they deserve and to ensure that taxpayer money is well spent. The public needs you now to create Thank pressure on the CTA to improve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutlutcher. Our final speaker will be Abigail Nichols. Ms. Nichols. Ms. Nichols, are you there?
She's online and unmuted. Ms. Ms. Nichols? Yes. Yes, Ms. Nichols, we can hear you. You can address the board now. Thank you. Sure. I'm Abigail Nichols. I live in Streeterville. I'm advocating for electric buses today. I speak on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Chicago. I am also grateful for the environmental leadership of the Chicago Chapter of Climate Reality, of which I am also a member. Between us, my husband and I take about 10 bus rides a week. This morning, I was so pleased to find myself riding an electric bus on Route 66. Thank you for this opportunity to praise Chicago bus drivers and to ask you to help them and all the rest of us by speeding up your transition to electric buses. When we moved to Chicago three years ago from Washington, D.C., we were delighted to find so much good public transportation. And we think the public, the bus drivers are the best part of CTA. They're fantastic. We use the trains, but it is the bus drivers who have been so helpful as we learned our way around Chicago. I admire and applaud their equanimity in the face of the, of the confused tourists, the bad drivers, the double parked trucks, and the thoughtless pedestrians they encounter every day. I got my lost cell phone back because a bus driver on the 147 route found my phone and turned it in. It is better for our bus drivers and for the rest of us if CTA stops buying diesel buses now. The air pollution to which diesel engines contribute translates directly into negative health, health consequences for drivers and for the rest of us. But worse, the long-term survival of the human race is now at stake. Our last two centuries of burning fossil fuels are bringing the world to climate disaster. The long term is now the short term. Please, please speed up your transition to electric vehicles. The world is approaching crisis and you have a chance for leadership. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you, Ms. Nichols. Uh, Chairman Barkley, uh, the four speakers have finished their remarks. I want to thank all the public commenters this afternoon um, for taking the time out to uh, to, to come and share with us your concerns. Are there any other members that want to address the public comments? I just want to join also to say thank you for taking out the time and coming before the board with your concern. Thank you. Our next order of business is the president's report. President Carter. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, members of the board, today's meeting the moment action plan progress update reflects the continued hard work and focus of my staff that, that, have they, that they have utilized to, to make improvements in CTA service. Each month, we are seeing improvements across key performance areas. I am heartened by our progress, but I recognize and admit, as you heard from our public commenters today, that there is still more work to do. I think it's also important to understand that this is a very complex issue that was not going to be solved overnight. And we will continue to work hard to make sure that not only we work to make we're communicating the work that we're doing to the public so that they understand the progress that we are making. Our employees certainly understand the urgency of the moment, and we are making strides every month to try to address these problems. As you are aware, our plan is built upon five pillars, all of which receive our attention every day. They include delivering reliable and consistent service, enhancing safety and security for our riders, improving the customer experience at our facilities, upgrading our digital tools to improve rider communication, and investing in our employees. As we continue to make progress on each pillar, in the interest of time, I will be updating you here today on certain highlights of our accomplishment. And we will continue to be transparent in our work on each of the pillars as we move forward. For instance, we continue to make progress on the deployment of our two-person K-9 teams, up from 28 fully trained units last month to 40 today, with the full deployment of all 50 teams anticipated by year's end. 
We also continue to work on updates to our bus and train trackers. We believe that these improvements will directly benefit our riders and look forward to discussing the details of those improvements in the very near future. Progress is being also made in the ongoing discussions with our bus and rail unions about employee recruitment and retention measures. I plan to update you on those on those initiatives in the very new in the very near future. Understandably, as we're in negotiations with the union itself, I do not want to get into a lot of detail regarding those those discussions at this time. Over the past several board meetings, I've discussed our meeting the moment scorecard. I believe it's important to ensure that we are transparent as possible regarding the steps CTA is taking related to its action plan and the progress that is being made because of those efforts. While discussions about CTA service issues is an ongoing topic of discussion in the news media, on social networking platforms, and elsewhere, it's important that people know what we are doing. I think this scorecard provides information that we will that will go a long way with adding more data for consideration among those who are watching our progress. Last week, we enhanced the scorecard from a summary one-page document to a six-page document. The detailed information dives into a before and after analysis of the new rail schedule implemented on October 23rd, and it allows riders to track our progress by rail line and weekday versus weekend service. The scorecard is primarily focused on rail service, but in the coming months, we will, be, we will provide additional analysis on bus service as we implement the optimization of the bus schedules in the very near future. Also included in the scorecard, we are providing several charts and graphs to show when and where our ridership has seen growth. As we continue to roll this tool out, we plan to get more questions, we plan and expect to get more questions about service and our action plan. But that is exactly the point. The information is available and should be available to everyone. I believe this process will only work if we are transparent and let the public and our customers know what we are doing, how we are doing it, and what progress we're making towards our accomplished goals. Our most recent report card demonstrates that we are doing well in terms of hitting some of our rolling targets. Just as it will undoubtedly show monthly progress in some key areas, it will also reveal where we are experiencing challenges and need to improve. I made a commitment in August that CTA will do better, and I invite anyone interested in following our progress to watch our scorecard very closely. One of the most important ways we can immediately and positively impact our ability to deliver better service and reliably for our customers is aligning our current number of buses and rail operators with CTA service schedules. While we, be, while we are bringing more employees aboard each week, we must also ensure that we are reducing long wait times and inconsistent rail service as soon as possible. On October 23rd, CTA introduced new rail schedules that reflect our efforts to provide service based on our current workforce levels. This rail schedule optimization is a temporary adjustment that will address current issues with inconsistent and unreliable service while the CTA continues to pursue aggressive hiring strategies for both bus operators. For, this, for the past several weeks, we have seen noticeable improvements in rail service reliability following the implementation of the new schedules. Most notably, we have seen a significant reduction in both double and triple headways and shortened customers' wait times across the system. Pages two and three of the meeting the moment scorecard show the results from our service optimization work. Key takeaways from our recent rail schedule optimization are shown in the scorecard are an increased percentage of service delivered on our rail lines. For example, in October, 77.2% of system-wide rail service was delivered, which is an increase from the 71.8% in August of this year. Instances of customers experiencing long wait times for trains, gaps known as double and triple of the scheduled headways on weekdays has dropped, with triple headways down 80% and double headways down 37%. On the brown, orange, green, and pink lines, we are seeing significant improvements in the percentage of weekday scheduled service delivered compared to previous months, reductions in large gaps of service. 
But while service has improved in many areas, the blue line and the red line service continue to see challenges from workforce unavailability, slow zones on the blue line Forest Park branch, and inter intermittent weekend construction impacts. We continue to be focused on addressing these issues and will continue to look for opportunities and investments to further improve this service in the near future. We will be making similar adjustments on the bus side of the house in the near future as well and look forward to, to soon briefing you regarding improvements there. It is our expectation that we'll be putting in place the schedule, adjusted schedule optimization efforts very soon in the, by the near, nearly, near the end of this year and early next year, which will then hopefully start to provide similar results on bus that we have seen on rail. Beyond more information on service optimization or scorecard, you will also see more detail on bus and rail ridership results, specifically how current ridership is performing compared to pre-COVID levels by rail line and bus route group, such as loop routes, south side routes, et cetera. You can also see ridership by weekday versus weekend and time of day to see where we are seeing strong ridership recovery and where we are experiencing lower return to pre-COVID ridership levels. We are also continuing our aggressive hiring and recruitment campaign with two upcoming job fairs this month, including one this Friday at Olive Harvey College on the far south side. CJ continues to pursue applicants for both bus operator and bus mechanic positions, both of which are unionized jobs with competitive pay, pension, excellent health benefits, and opportunities for advancement. We are continuing to utilize every medium at our disposal to get the word out about these fairs and to encourage potential job seekers to consider working for CTA. At the October board meeting, I also advised this body that I was encouraged by the progress that we've been making on our 2022 goals for station improvements and investments under our Refresh and Renew program. And I would like to update you with updated numbers today. I'm happy to inform you that our staff has completed more than 80% of the work outlined for nearly 30 rail stations that were scheduled to receive extensive improvements and more than 90 stations that were slated to receive painting and lighting improvements this year. Refresh and Renew does far more than just beautify stations. Improved lighting, surface repairs, and replacement of outdated and damaged signage all contribute to making our customers and employees safer. Cleaner stations with fresh paint and graffiti removed make the CTA travel experience more pleasant and attractive, which hopefully also encourages ridership. In total, CTA anticipates investing $3.5 million in the Refresh and Renew investments in 2022, and I will update you on the additional investments we make into the system and of the program in the future. <clears throat> Along with enhancing transparency through our scorecard, I've also made clear since availing our action plan that a key component of our Meeting the Moment initiative is ongoing focused assessment of the impact that our investments and improvements are having on the customer's travel experience. The need for CTA to determine and assess customer mood is not new. We frequently utilize surveys for that exact purpose. I believe, however, that the surveys that immediately predated the release of our plan and those that follow for the foreseeable future will be especially useful in helping us move CTA beyond our current challenges. CTA conducted a recent customer survey of frequent and infrequent CTA riders who traveled between April, May, and June of this year. And I want to be clear that this survey was completed days before I unveiled the Meeting the Moment Action Plan. In fact, its results show that our plan was exactly the right thing to do. The data captured by the survey confirmed we already knew. Our customers are dissatisfied with wait times, with service reliability, with bus tracker accuracy, and personal security. While there are also positive takeaways, the issues that raised help, the, the issues they raised help provide a baseline beyond the numbers and areas where we are experiencing challenges. <clears throat> These surveys are an excellent tool to help ensure that we are clear regarding what CTA riders are thinking and experiencing in their own words. In fact, we will be conducting additional surveys throughout the next year to get a clearer sense of our action plan and how it's impacting rider decisions and how riders are feeling about the system. I will continue to apprise the board as future survey results become available because I want to ensure that you too are aware of this, this important customer feedback tool, which we will continue to utilize as one of the many tools to show the progress that we are making 
or the challenges that we are facing with our Beating the Moment Action Plan. With that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I hope that you find this update helpful, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you. Thank you, President Carter, um, for that update. Uh, first, I want to commend you and your staff for meeting with the City Council last week and as, along with the uh, County Board as well uh, earlier um, and want to basically thank you for your thoughtful discussion with them. I know you answered a lot of questions that they had. and uh, But want to know, is there a mechanism whereby you will be communicating more effectively with the uh, members of the Council and, and County Board? Yes, as I, as I committed to the, the City Council at that meeting, um, I am prepared to meet with them um, as they determine appropriate going forward. Uh, I also intend to keep the, the aldermen updated on our progress on the Meeting the Moment plan. Uh, there is a newsletter that we are creating and have created that provide monthly updates on the plan, which will also be shared with all the aldermen and elected officials to make sure that they know where we are and what we are doing, uh, as well as our scorecard and the information that I just shared with the board it will also be transmitted to all the aldermen so that they can see the progress that we're making, along with follow-ups by my staff to see if they have any questions, any additional information, uh, or want to talk to me directly about any of the issues that we're dealing with. Thank you. I'd like to open it up to any other directors that may have questions for President Carter based upon his report this afternoon. Well, I'd just like to join and say uh, thanks to President Carter for the representation and how he's uh, stood before the uh, council. I guess my uh, concern hearing the uh, speakers and also hearing in the community, the plan to, I guess, deal with the workers. It seemed to be a red flag that's being raised. Uh, I think you had shared about uh, in, in the, uh, about trying to get back even uh, people who had left CTA retired, but how do we make this a place where people want to work it's, uh, you know, CTA is top flight, but we're losing some of the uh, workers and uh, what is the opportunity to bring on new people? You know, it, it, the comments that, are, that were made about the circumstances in which our employees work um, is difficult. Um, our employees are subject to a level of abuse by the public on a daily basis that no no person should ever have to put up with. That's true. Um, I have personally seen incidents of behavior that is deplorable and totally unacceptable. Uh, and I am working closely with the union leadership on ways to address that. Uh -huh. um, there is no simple solution to what's going on in society today around the way people behave. <laughs> And I have made this point on previous occasions that what happens on CTA is a reflection of what's going on in our society. And as you see increased violence, as you see increasing levels of disrespect uh, and inappropriate behavior in our society, you also see it on CTA. Um, our employees are doing an unbelievable job every single day, and I couldn't be more proud of the work that they are doing. We are certainly working closely with the union, and one of the things that I mentioned in my report is trying to find ways to provide more financial incentives to support them in the work that they do. Okay. But we're also talking about things like mental health, yeah. how we can support them in terms of dealing with the stress okay. that comes with being in these positions. Uh, and I've directed my staff recently to look at how we can improve and, and, and upgrade the mental support services that we give to our employees in a much more proactive way so that they can know that there's help out there for them and their assistance that they can get uh, if they need it. Um, we're going to be looking at ways in which we can improve our employee feedback as well, uh, not unlike what I'm talking about with the customer feedback. Our employees have great ideas. They are the eyes and ears of the system. They see a lot of stuff that goes on. When I talk to them, I always walk away with new information that I didn't know beforehand of things that we can do to improve and to make our system not only better for our customers, but better for our employees. 
And I want our employees to know that I'm hearing that information. Um, um, we, we want to have a open and friendly environment for our employees under less than ideal circumstances. And we'll continue to work with the union to find ways that we can improve upon that, to let our employees know that we appreciate them, to do the little things that can make a difference uh, in people's lives, while continuing to work hard on the more difficult things that obviously need to be addressed, like crime, uh, that ultimately impacts not only our customers, but our employees as well. I'm committed to doing what we can to address that, and I've made that point to both the leaders of our bus operator as well as our rail operator unions in conversations that I've had with them. Thank you. Great. Thank you, President Carter. Our next order of business is the approval of the board minutes of October 14th, 2022. I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting of October 14th, 2022. So moved. Second. By Director Miller, <clears throat> excuse me, seconded by Director Jakes. Um, Director Lee? Yes. Um, Director Ortiz? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Director Silva? Yes. Chairman Barkley? Yes. So that motion is approved with six yes votes. Next order of business is executive session. It's my understanding, Kent, that there's no executive session today. Correct, Chairman. There's no executive session today. Thank you. Our next order of business is board matters. May I have a motion to approve a resolution setting the date, time of the November 22nd, no, November 2022 Chicago Transit Board regular board meeting. So move. Thank you. Moved by Director Miller, seconded by Director Jakes. Uh, Director Lee? Yes. Director Ortiz? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Director Silva? Yes. Chairman Barkley? Yes. That motion is approved with six yes votes. <coughs> Next order of business today is a report from the Committee of Finance, Audit, and Budget, Director Silva. The committee, on met, er, the committee met earlier this afternoon and approved the October 14 committee minutes and reviewed the finance report. The committee reviewed nine ordinance. Ordinance amending ordinance 021-119 approving the fiscal year 2022-2026 capital improvement program. Ordinance adopting a budget for calendar year 2023 and financial plan for calendar years 2024 and 2025. An ordinance approving the fiscal years 2023-2027 capital improvement program and authorizing the filing and execution of grants and cooperative agreements and amendments and related materials. An ordinance authorizing an amendment to a license agreement with mobile cubes to install, operate, and maintain mobile charging vending machines at designated rail stations. An ordinance authorizing a sublease to Air Act RXHST Manager LLC, a portion of property located at 120 North Racine. Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, an ordinance authorizing a license agreement with Rush University Medical Center for property located at 301-339 South Damon Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, an ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Chicago to receive transit tax increment financing revenues for the Red Line Extension Project an ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with METRA for rail replacement shuttle blast services. An ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Chicago through its Department of Family and Support Services for outreach to individuals in need of shelter. The committee also reviewed six contracts. The committee approved and and recommend for board approval all nine ordinance and the six contracts. Committee place eight of the ordinance and five of the contracts and the 
on the omnibus. However, poor agenda item number seven dash F, the license agreement with Rush Medical Center and committee contract G2, the CARA soft technology contract were not placed on the omnibus and will require separate votes. And that concludes my report, Chairman Berry. Thank you, Director Silva. May I now have a motion to approve the omnibus as stated by Director Silva. So moved. Second. By Director Miller, second by Director Jakes. Uh, Director Lee? Yes. Director Ortiz? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Director Silva? Yes. Chairman Barkley? Yes. That motion is approved with six yes votes, sir. Our next order of business is the approval of board agenda item number 7F, an ordinance authorizing a license agreement with Rush University Medical Center. May I have a motion to approve? So move. Second. Moved by Director Miller, second by Director Jakes. Um, Director Lee? Yes. Director Ortiz? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Uh, Director Silva? Yes. Uh, did you not want to abstain on this, Director? This is the Rush the rush Ordinance? Abstain. Abstain. Uh, Chairman Barkley? Yes. That motion is approved with five yes votes, and Director Silva abstained from voting. Our next order of business is the approval of contract G2, the Kerasoft technology contract. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Moved by Director Miller, second by Director Jakes. Uh, Director Lee? Yes. Director Ortiz? Yes. Director Jakes? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Director Silva? Yes. Chairman Barkley? Yes. That motion is approved with six yes votes. Our next order of business is the construction report. Juan Pablo Prieto. Uh, good afternoon again. I'm Bill Mooney, your Chief Infrastructure Officer. And we will begin where we normally do is our Your New Blue Signals project between Jefferson Park and O'Hare. And I'm happy to say this will be the last time we discuss start at this spot. Um, this project is substantially complete. The final cutover of Rosemont East being finished recently. Um, we will have a bunch of punch lists and closeout items over the upcoming months that we'll be uh, working on to clear out the rest of, of the details on this project. But all the major activities are done at this point. So we can move to some of those final pictures. So this is a new panel up in Rosemont Tower. Um, this is similar to a lot of the other ones I've shown you, especially O'Hare, it operates multiple interlockings, including the main interlockings around the Rosemont Yard. Uh, as part of the renovation, we actually renovated the entire tower, new ceiling uh, new ceiling panels, new tiles, new paint, um, upgraded window features as well for the, for the employees that actually work in that space. Next slide. And here's a shot of uh, the uh, commissioned in-service yard. This is looking east towards uh, the station at Rosemont from the tower panel itself. So this is the Rosemont East interlocking, the last piece of the puzzle there in the next picture. And this is the other direction. So this gives you a look at the yard on the other side of that and the special work and some of the things that were activated. The Rosemont West portion of it is actually at the very far end of the yard. You can actually see a couple of the 7,000 series cars sitting there in the yard um, off on the right of the screen. And I'll pause here. Juan Pablo, would you like to provide a DBE update on the contract? Thanks, Bill. Um, good afternoon, directors. Juan Pablo Prieto, Director of Diversity Programs. Um, we set a split goal. This is actually one of the first contracts where we split the design and construction goals. It had a 10% design and a 15% construction goal. Um, the contractor committed to the 10 and 15 uh, and is currently um, over attaining uh, on both, both of those goals. So we are confident that they will meet those goals, um, if not exceed them by the end of the, of the project. Thank you, Juan Pablo. And I just like to give a lot of credit to the team that saw this get across the finish line. It was a really, really tough project to deliver. Excuse me, Juan Pablo. I think uh, President Carter wants to say something. I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize my mic was off. Um, I, I, I'm probably going to say something that Bill is going to ready to say. I, I just wanted to make the point that, as, as Juan Pablo mentioned, this is the first time, this is the first project where we took this approach with how we would, would um, handle the DBE goal for a major construction project with CTAs. And this was this was a concept that was actually brought to us by the DBE community as one of their concerns on how how the DBE participation was happening on contracts like this, um, particularly from the architecture and engineering firms who felt that in many cases they weren't getting these opportunities because they were backloading, the projects were backloading the DBE participation on the construction side of the project and not on the engineering services side of the project. And so 
to hear the results that that Juan Pablo just mentioned about this, and not only yeah, that, goal, but they exceeded the goal. Uh, I think it's a major accomplishment by CPA, uh, and certainly a, a great opportunity to, to recognize both Bill and Juan Pablo for our creativity, not only in, in pursuing this policy, but also making it clear to our primes that we expected them to, to live up to our expectations about DB participation on this kind of work. This work in particular is very difficult to get a lot of DB participation on. It's very technical, it's very detailed. Uh, there are not a lot of DBEs that operate in this space. And so uh, I, I'm just, I just wanted to point out how, how big of a deal it is for us to achieve this yeah. on this type of project. And it's obviously a strategy that we're now using in other contracts going forward. I think we're gonna see similar results. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And the only other thing I would add is before we move on is I just really want to give a lot of credit to the team that saw this off across the finish line. It was a very, very long project that um, had a lot of ups and downs and a lot of challenges, and they continued to, to charge it forward. And these can be very taxing jobs, um, especially signal jobs. They, they're so incredibly technical that they just, you get lost in those meetings pretty quickly. So I, I give that team a lot of credit. So my great thanks. Uh, on to our next project. So this is our traction power upgrades between Kedville Edmonds and Sacramento substation. I'm also pleased to report this for the last time I'm reporting on this project as it is substantially complete. Um, the last pieces of work really were on Sacramento roofing and the courtyard wall, and we can look at some of those photos. Um, so here's the completely rebuilt courtyard wall. I've shown you some, some work on that over the prior months from the side profile. Um, it's, the, it's the edge of the building kind of to the right there. This was a pretty big issue. It was structurally failed that we had ahead of it majorly shored to keep it uh, in place. And so that, that was a really uh, important piece of this project. And our last slide shows the roof work in progress. Um, this is again kind of a unique opportunity that the team uh, thought very thoughtfully about this. This is an area that typically just attraction power upgrades in and of itself would, would limit participation in a project like this. There's very few uh, people that do that type of technical work in the DBE community. And by partnering with some of the envelope work and things like that, we were able to really come up with a project that was holistic and allowed lots of opportunities. And I'll pause and let Juan Pablo talk about them. Thanks, Bill, again. Um, I think we set a 25% DB goal, like Bill said, because we had more of that envelope work. We were able to uh, set a higher DB goal uh, on this project, and the prime committed um, to 25.71%, uh, and we're confident that they will attain that uh, by the end of final payment. Great. Thanks, Juan Pablo. And moving on to our next project. Uh, so this is a new project this month, uh, something that is not traditional for us to talk about. This is actually a, a project that's being um, performed by the Chicago Department of Transportation on our behalf. Uh, it's had a lot of kind of call outs in the newspaper as of lately. And as we partner with them on this project and, and participate in some of the oversight of it, I wanted to share some of the updates as it comes up uh, on a monthly basis. This is a pretty high profile project that we have impacts uh, to our customer base as well as the railroad around it. Uh, so this is the Lake Line Damon station. So this is an infill station that CDOT is building at Damon, just west of the United Center. Um, it is what uh, they have awarded a construction contract value of $67 million for the station proper contract. The contractor is FH Passion and Perkins and Will was the designer of record. And as is the nature of um, Chicago, see so Chicago contracts, it has an MBE goal of 30%, a WBE goal of 8%, and a VBE goal of 0.96%, um, where we typically talk about it in a relationship to our program being a DBE program. This is slightly different, so it'll be reported on in that relationship a little differently. But I wanted to highlight some of the activities on the site and, and keep you abreast of um, the project as we kind of move through it. Um, most of the stuff to date is based on kind of the deep foundation work around caissons for the station house itself, as well as relocating cables and other things out of the, uh, the footprint of the project. We can see some photos around that. Um, well, here's a rendering uh, to give you a sense of what the new station will look like. Uh, it has a pretty large courtyard opening, uh, you know, expecting large crowds around Bulls and Blackhawks games coming and going uh, along the site, as well as a bridge that provides access between the two platforms. Um, here is the first bit of work on site. So these are case sounds very similar to what you've seen on some of the other projects I've presented on um, that allow for the deep foundations and the stability for the, for the structure, that big bridge that goes across. Next slide. And they're already starting to receive the steel on site. So as, the, as they set those case sounds, they'll start building up the steel structure that goes around it um, as it moves forward. And I'll provide updates uh, as we go forward on that. So our next project is non-revenue rail vehicle maintenance facility, continues on budget and on schedule. And most of the work continues around the foundation of the building itself and the site work. And we can look at a couple of uh, ideas, uh, photos around this. So this is, I've shown you a lot of uh, 
photos about the site retention, the water retention on site as we as, as we actually are retaining over 150% of the, the sustainability requirement for water on site. We actually then do have to tie back into the sewer system. So this is part of that tie-in point um, being put in place. Next slide. Um, and here's the site as a whole. So I've shown you over months uh, the helical piles being installed, as well as the uh, the foundational walls all the way around, and, and the grade beams. And so now they've graded out the site and are getting ready to start pouring the foundation and then setting walls. And so you'll see photos of that over the next couple of months. Um, but this again gives you a sense of the scale and scope of the size of this building itself in relationship to some of the buildings in the background. Next slide. This is our canal tie house, Barry and Damon substation upgrade project. Uh, proceeds forward on schedule and on budget. You can look at some photos of the work here. And I'll explain what's going on. So this is the uh, um, in the canal tie house. We're actually installing a new duct bank in the subway that will allow us to feed power to the various power sections in the subway. And so this is that duct bank being formed against the wall. Ultimately, will be encased in concrete. Next slide. Um, here we are at Damon. So similar to the caissons I showed you over at uh, Damon on the green line. Here's Damon on the blue line where we're installing micro piles, which are uh, much smaller versions of caissons that are then tied together for the foundation. Ultimately, the grade beams of the building get supported on this. Uh, there's about 50 of them on site. Next slide. Um, and here's uh, Haymarket. So Haymarket is just down the block from us at uh, 567 West Lake, and it's a substation that actually supports the Green Line predominantly, but we're actually doing a bunch of upgrades to this facility because we will be tying into, as part of the canal uh, tie house, actually the power on the Green Line. We'll be sharing power between the Green Line and the Blue Line, which allows us to not need a new substation there. There's a lot of capacity on the Green Line, but we're actually in the process of upgrading all that equipment at Haymarket to make sure it's, it's durable and will withstand that extra load. So they've had to remove the courtyard wall here and they're starting to swap some of that equipment. Next slide. Um, and here is our refresh and renewed program. We are coming to the finish line of the station projects for this, uh, this season. It is a bit of a seasonal program where we work on the customer facing stations over the winter, over the summer months. And then we actually move into our, our employee facing facilities, so our bus garages and rail shops during the winter months. And so um, we typically report on the, the rail stations. So here are the last view that we're finishing up and next month I'll, I'll provide you the final updates on some of these and uh, we can move forward with some of those photos so it's here central on the green line yeah uh, exterior painting so this is a bigger profile than we typically get into the exteriors of the station they actually were up on the roof line for the head house of that station I think it, it, it's amazing um, just kind of how how fresh that is that that curb appeal to the station and then what it says to the surrounding community as well right next slide um, some here's some interior work. At, uh, we've done this a lot on the Congress stations where we've gotten up into those upper parts of the canopy where we've scraped and painted them and really give that whole whole profile in there as well as the lighting upgrades. Next slide. Um, here's one of those Congress stations. So here's Harlem on the far west end of, of the blue line and the exterior station house. We've upgraded the signage as well as all the lighting to LEDs, uh, painted everything, refreshed all the, uh, the steel curtain walls and everything there. Next slide. Um, and here is the stairwell ramp. So here you can see the impact of, again, that painting and scraping of the canopy there. Next slide. Um, here's the uh, proper platform area. So you can see the upgrades to lighting again and the painting of the platform canopy structures as well as the underside of the canopy. And here we are. This is uh, part of our, our seasonal prep. So we actually replaced all the people heaters here. Um, those come on November 1st, part of our seasonal program to keep a lot of warmth during those warm, uh, those cold winter months. And so here's those upgraded heaters. And uh, as part of this, we also work with our signage team to identify areas where we can upgrade the signage here. So on the left, you'll see the original signage for the corridor there. Um, it's been upgraded to our new signage standard on the right with full replacement signage as well. Um, and I will move on to our RPM phase one program, which continues on budget and tight to schedule. We move forward to kind of the progress side here. So a lot of activity. Uh, each month we, we take major strides forward in the RPB corridor. We've spent a lot of time focusing on the stage two work. We've come to completion of drilling the last of the, of the drill shafts there uh, for that stage, North Main Lane stage two, as well as starting to uh, install those precast beams and set the concrete deck where possible. On LBMM, we proceed forward with the segmental box installations uh, as we come to the completion of the last of columns up in that area. And we, we're forming track behind it. So I've shown you some of uh, the track work in the past. We're starting to weld rail and bring other things in there. And we continue to advance our quarter signal improvements, which is one of the later phases of all this. Let's look at some photos. So here is uh, the last of those drilled uh, cage, uh, those great case on cages for stage two. There'll be more as we move into stage three, but um, this finishes off the leg that we're currently on. Here's that cage being set. You can get a sense of the height of the cage as it goes down actually into the, the rock in the area. Next slide. 
um, here's that stage two deck. Uh, so we, it's been formed underneath the base pours in place and they're starting to install um, the formwork for the track pours itself. So next slide. Um, here's the uh, old Ravenswood structure there that's in, in restoration. So here they're using uh, micro piles and, and restoring the foundations there for that original structure. Next slide. And here's some of the work up on LBMM. So this is actually where we transition from the uh, the new structure to the old embankment near Thorndale. And this is up near Ardmore where they're actually have set the, con uh, the steel beams and are in the process of forming out to be able to pour the concrete deck on that area. Next slide. Um, here is the, for the temporary stations at Argyle. So as we move into uh, stage B up in LBMM, we will actually shift the temporary stations at Argyle. And uh, this is the new foundation for the new uh, temporary station house that we'll be using during that phase. And next slide, please. And here's the Winona Relay House. Last month, I showed you that, that temporary station uh, foundation there for the, the relay house that facilitates the signal movements in the middle track there. And so here's actually the walls being built for that facility itself. Next slide. And what would not what would be update without a, a picture of the segmental erection. So we are coming to conclusion of, of the segments actually towards the end of this year, we'll be finishing up all the uh, phase A work here for uh, stage A work for, for the segments, which is a pretty big milestone in the project. And I'm glad to show you some of those photos as we finish up. It's, a, it's still one of the more neat aspects of the project. Next slide. Um, and then on the tail is the track work. So here they are uh, prepping the plifts after they're being poured, finishing them off, and then they'll start setting the plates and the rail on top of them. So next month, we should have some good photos of that work. Next slide. And our community activities can uh, continue forward. We regularly coordinate again with the 44th, 48th Ward Alderman's offices. We provide uh, site tours for various groups and communications. We've been working very closely with Gaudi Elementary throughout the project, but uh, also very much recently as uh, the, the gantry has been in the footprint of Gaudi. And they've been more directly able to see kind of the progress of the work and the, and the gantry that they named. We continue to host our monthly virtual office hours and are open for business campaign. It's been focused in the red purple bypass area, uh, specifically around Penny's Noodles. And with that, I'll turn it over to Juan Pablo. Thanks again, Bill. Uh, we continue to meet monthly with, with the contractor to make sure that uh, any uh, further uh, scopes are, are sent out to the DBE community um, through the prime uh, CTA and our assist agencies. Um, and we continue to talk with our workforce partners as well as the contractors um, to maximize opportunities in workforce. Um, to, uh, as of November 1st, DBEs have been awarded over $230 million. Um, that went to 84 unique DBEs, 32 of which are new to CTA with the project. And as of November 1st, uh, the project has produced over 992,000 labor hours and workers have earned over $57 million. So as you can see, we are heading towards that 1 million uh, labor hour mark, which will be about halfway through the projected labor hours on the project. And we're very excited um, with that milestone and, and the achievements that we've had. Um, those $57 million um, have been earned uh, by over 1,700 uh, unique uh, individuals on the project. And that concludes my portion of the report. Happy to answer any questions. No questions. questions. Any questions, uh, Director Silva? No questions. Uh, Director Lee, Ortiz, or Jakes, any questions for the team? No questions. No questions. Just, I'm sorry, Director Lee. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just saying no questions. Yeah, I just want to, again, encourage and share my support for these efforts, particularly the split also that you mentioned earlier regarding professional services as DBEs as well, and just throughout the process. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. So I appreciate that level of understanding of the work ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you, Director. Thank you again, uh, Bill and Juan Pablo. Our next order of business is new business. I understand that there is new business, although bittersweet. <laughs> I'd like to take this time to recognize and acknowledge Assistant Board Secretary Greg Mangini who is retiring after yeah. 24 great years at CTA. Greg has become an institution at CTA, particularly the board office. Some of our members of the public know his contact information by heart. 
and use it often when in need of assistance. And he's become a familiar face and voice as a facilitator of our board meetings. Greg is also our resident historian of all things CTA and City of Chicago. A Google search pales in comparison to his recall of past board action and precedent. His institutional knowledge has become a tremendous help to this board from onboarding new directors to guiding the board through precedent to better understanding a policy under consideration. Above all, Greg is known for his dedication to the public and the professionalism he demonstrates in everything he does. It is for these reasons and many more why Greg is greatly appreciated and will be sorely missed by the board and by the entire agency. Greg, thank you for your dedicated and exemplary service to this board and to the Chicago Transit Authority. On behalf of the board, I wish you the best in your retirement. We'd like to honor you with a resolution in recognition of your service to CTA. Resolution of appreciation to Chicago Transit Authority Board, Transit Board Assistant Secretary Greg Longani. Whereas Greg Longani was appointed to Assistant Secretary to the Chicago Transit Board in October 1998. And whereas Mr. Longini has served in that role for 24 years, making him the longest tenured person in that position in CTA's history. Whereas Mr. Longini has served as assistant secretary under the leadership of four board chairs. And whereas before his appointment by the Chicago Transit Board, Mr. Longini worked in many roles with the city of Chicago including the Department of Planning, the Department of Economic Development, and the Mayor's Office of, for People with Disabilities, and also was an adjunct professor at the University of Illinois Chicago Graduate School of Planning, and a senior research associate at the American Planning Association. Whereas Mr. Longini was a driving force in the development and implementation of the website that makes all transit board ordinance, ordinances accessible to the public. And whereas Mr. Longini has always approached his role with professionalism, enthusiasm, dedication, and good humor. And whereas Mr. Longini is extremely knowledgeable in the history of the city of Chicago and enjoyed sharing that knowledge and whereas Mr. Longini has played an essential role in the implementation and administration of the ethics training for CTA officers and employees. And whereas over the past 24 years, Mr. Longini has attended and moderated over 300 meetings of the Chicago Transit Board and its committees and the CTA Citizens Advisory Board. Whereas through his years serving as Assistant Secretary to the Transit Board, Mr. Longini has demonstrated a passion for ensuring the public's access to information, has worked tirelessly to ensure the ability of the public to voice their concerns to the board. Whereas Mr. Longini val Mr. Longini's valued his responsibilities involved in communicating with the public and would even meet with the public outside of CTA's offices, such as at transit stations to ensure that their voices would be heard and ensure that he or his staff follow up with concerned citizens on all open issues. Whereas Mr. Longini has announced his retirement from his position as assistant secretary, now therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Chicago Transit Board wish to acknowledge Mr. Longini's many contributions and accomplishments and extend to him their sincere appreciation for his dedicated service over the past 24 years 
and wish him well in his retirement. Be it further resolved that the officers and employees of the Chicago Transit Authority join in this expression of appreciation and extend their best wishes to Mr. Longini. Be it further resolved that this resolution be spread of record upon the minutes of this meeting and that a suitable copy of the resolution be presented to Greg. Thank you very much for your service to the board of, um, we can't even measure what you've contributed to us, Greg. And we really, really deeply appreciate the years of service that you've given to this board. From the bottom of our hearts, we want to thank you and your family for their sacrifice of uh, sharing you with us. At this time, I'd like to open it up to any other well, President Carter first, and then uh, we'll open it up to the board members thereafter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I don't really know what to say at this point, and Greg knows that I'm rarely without words. Um, and it's, it's really hard to imagine being in a board meeting um, or in a budget hearing where I haven't heard Greg's voice lead us through the through the entire process. Um, as you indicated, for 24 years, Greg's deaf guidance to the board, our staff, and public speakers has become ubiquitous. And in some way, Greg has become a CTA icon of sorts. I suppose that happens when you've been the longest serving assistant secretary uh, at CTA in CTA's history, an achievement for which, Greg, you should be very proud. While Greg's retirement is most certainly well-deserved, his well-known professionalism and commitment to excellence will be missed. It is not an overstatement to say that Greg is a quintessential, quintessential public servant who, committed, who is committed to serving this greater city since the very beginning of his career. For those of you who are unaware, Greg is actually a planner by academic training, having earned a master's degree in urban planning and policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago's Graduate School of Planning in the fall of 1979. Later that year, until 1984, he worked with the American Planning Association, and he also served on the faculty of the UIC Graduate School of Planning as an adjunct lecturer. In fact, Greg taught a Chicago planning development class at UIC, where some of our current CTA employees were students of his. Greg began his career at Chicago City Government in 1985 during the administration of the late Mayor Harold Washington. He went on to serve in the Department of Economic Development, the Department of Planning, Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, Neighborhood and Industrial Planning, and Media Relations. In 1998, Greg joined the CTA, and since assuming that role, as you indicated, he has never missed a board meeting um, or a budget hearing, and has attended more than 300 of them during his tenure. <clears throat> Over the years, Greg has sublimely played the combined role of air traffic controller, traffic cop, event coordinator for board meeting speakers, individuals who testify at budget time, and of course, numerous boards chairmen, directors, CTA presidents, and others who have served in leadership roles and who have looked at him for background on issues, logistical direction, and procedural rules. On a personal note, I've had the opportunity for work to work with Greg over many years of my career. Um, I remember when Greg came to CTA, we were both working for Valerie Jarrett at the time, and Valerie had nothing but tremendous words to say for him. And if any of you know Valerie, you know she does not give out praise lightly. Well, I thank Greg, you can clearly say as you come to the end of your career at CTA, that you lived up to Valerie's expectations. Um, in many ways, Greg's career has paralleled mine. Um, I too came to work in city government in 1984 under the Harold Washington administration. I too, here at CTA, came up through the ranks over the course of my career. And I too had the opportunity to work with, with Greg both as a senior executive and then ultimately as president of CTA. I can honestly tell you 
that I have never had a moment in my dealings with Greg that weren't enjoyable, professional, um, and pleasant yeah. uh, to deal to deal with. And that's in spite of some public hearings and budget hearings that were, to say the least, contentious. Um, Greg always maintained his demeanor. As you indicated, he always felt a, a, a responsibility to engage the public and to help support the public in their understanding and access to CTA. And on that basis alone, he will be tremendously missed. Um, Greg, it has been an honor and a pleasure to have worked with you over these years. I will certainly miss not seeing you here at CTA board meetings. I think both of us started with a lot less gray hair when we came to CTA. <laughs> both of us have a lot more today, but I can tell you that I have enjoyed every minute that I have spent working with you during the course of my career at CTA. And with that, I wish you Godspeed in your retirement. And on behalf of the entire family of CTA employees, I want to once again thank you and your family for your 24 years of service on behalf of the CTA and this board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, President. Do I would like to open up to any other board members here. Director Silva. Thank you, Greg. While your tenure on this board began well before I arrived, it has been an honor to have served with you over these past 18 years. Your unwavering dedication and commitment to the CTA and to the city of Chicago is inspiring to, all, to us all. You have helped guide us through some very trying times over the years, and we are extremely grateful for your service. You leave some very big shoes to fill. On behalf of myself, the board, and our fellow Chicago citizens, thank you and enjoy a much deserved retirement. Thank you. Very much. All right. I want to just join and say thanks, Greg, for your unwavering service and God bless you in your retirement. You certainly just made things so uh, easy coming on, being a new person. And I've just enjoyed uh, being a part of this board. And much of that has been because of your leadership, your compassion and concern. Remember, even during my grandson's illness, you'd always check on me and check on him. I just want to say thank you, and uh, as you retire, enjoy. Be blessed. Thank you. Director Ortiz. Yes, I just want to say thank you again for all of your contributions to the CTA and to our city because of your work. Um, it's exciting to know all of your background. Um, thank you for from a planner to another planner. Thank you to all the work that you've done. Uh, it's an inspiration to know and to support the, the vision of serving our city. Um, so thank you for all of your great work and enjoy your retirement. <laughs> thank you. Director Lee. Greg, we're going to miss you. <laughs> I, I know I've, I haven't had a chance to be <laughs> along with everyone else here, but uh, your services is, is, you know, is going to be sorely missed and, and your presence at the meetings is you know, it's not going to be the same without you, but wishing you all the best in your retirement. And thank you for all that you've done to help me get, you know, onboarded and, and everything just to, to get, um, you know, up to speed with everything here. And thank you, Greg. Thank you. Director Jakes. Greg, I am going to be very honest with you. I am not happy that you're leaving. <laughs> I'm not. I'm being very selfish. You know, when I found out uh, the other day, you know, it was it, it was like a, a rock had had I swallowed a rock because uh, in these past four years, you have indeed been the person. And this is no slight on anyone else, but you've been the person that I've connected with the most um, from noticing when you would get your hair cut. That's how much we connected. And I thought you were going to be around long enough that your hair would end up like mine. <laughs> but I see now that you know, this is what's best for you because it's not about us. It's what's yeah. best for you. And when I tell you, my friend, I am going to miss you terribly. Um, you have a very infectious 
attitude, which I love. You know, your attention to detail is superb. Um, and I'm, I'm going to miss you. I, like I said, it's just, it, I think the, our, our chairman said it earlier. It's just, you know, it's bittersweet. Bitter for me, sweet for you. But please don't be a stranger. And hopefully um, you'll share your personal information so that we can check on you and make sure that uh, all is well with you. But I want you to know, man, and, and I've never said it to you, but I'll say it to you now in this open form. I love you. I really do thank and praise God for you. You indeed made my transition onto the board uh, a smooth one. And you've helped me uh, try to develop a poker face when comments are happening that I don't necessarily agree with. Uh, so <laughs> thank you, Greg. Thank you, man. And enjoy, enjoy your time and don't be a stranger. And we won't either. All right. Um, uh, thank you all. I had not prepared anything, um, but I, so it's been a long day. It's been a long week, so I don't want to spend a lot of time, but it has been an honor to work here. Um, truly. Um, the dedication of the staff, the hard work, the brains. Um, it's a really an outstanding organization that I was proud to be a part of. Um, just a couple things. I, th I thought, as I was sitting here th listening to you, I thought I first stepped on a CTA train 54 years ago. I was 17 years old, starting at Loyola. I moved, this, I moved to the city from Joliet, and it was the week of the infamous Democratic National Convention, 1968, first week in Chicago. Yeah. And this orientation was the last week in August of 1968, and I was at Lakeshore Campus up in Rogers Park, and we were told the next day to walk across the street um, to the station, Loyola Station, and take it down to Chicago Avenue and visit the Lewis Towers campus. So that was my first L ride 54 years ago. And for 54 years, I have been an avid rider way before I ever worked here. Um, I took it at Loyola. Then when I was in graduate school at U of UIC, I lived in Logan Square and took the blue line. I forget what it was called then. My seven years at the American Planning Association in Hyde Park. I took the Jeffrey Express every day down there. My wife who never drove a car, her mother never drove a car. She's been on the Ellen trains her entire life. Um, so I was loved public transit then. And so I, it was an honor when Valerie asked me to come over here in 1998. Um, and again, this it was an honor to work here given someone who's been in my position here, seeing all that has been done for all these years, not by me um, and nothing but, but words to say. And I always tell everybody, the CTA does such incredible work. On a personal level, I wanna thank Adrian and Janice, who I've worked with for 25 years, day in and day out. April, who joined that team. And, and Denise, I think I have to put in there as well because of all the board stuff, people I worked with closest. Um, I can't even begin to thank the hundreds of people that I've worked with here in this organization. By being involved in ethics, I got to know everybody in the garages, in the field, and just the hundreds of people I've worked with. But President Carter, I, I take your, your comments to heart and it has been wonderful to work with you all these years. Even even like some of the tough times back when the, some of the Valerie and Frank issues that they have to get in the middle of yeah. and try to straighten out um, with two, uh, two very forceful people in their own right that we were the ones who often had to sort of make it work out. Um, and the Kent and the previous general counsels that I worked with so closely and going all the way back to Duncan Harris. And then finally uh, to the board, to the four, the four board chairman, Valerie, Carroll, Terry and Lester. Uh, it's been an honor to work for you and to all the other um, board members, um, Michelle, Rosa, uh, Bernard, Reverend Miller, um, Alex, we've worked with so long. Um, 
And Lester, thank you so much for your support and to all the other board members that I've worked for, which is too many to, to list. I will miss you all deeply. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I turn it back to you, Chairman. Thank you. Now I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the resolution of appreciation. So move Chicago Transit Board Assistant Secretary Greg Longini. Um, and Greg, we're gonna give you the privilege of calling the roll for the last time. <laughs> Next to last time. All right, uh, the resolution moved by Director Miller, seconded by Director Jakes. Uh, Director Lee? Yes. Director Ortiz? Yes. Uh, Director Jakes? Yes. Director Miller? Yes. Uh, Director Silva? Yes. Chairman Barkley? Yes. So that motion is approved with six yes votes. Thank you. Since there is no further business to come before the board, may I have a motion to adjourn? So move. I don't want it to end because I so I don't want it to end. <laughs> You know, just if, if we don't end the meeting, then Greg doesn't go anywhere. And <laughs> nice, Jay. <laughs> I'll just say, go. I'll go ahead and second it. <laughs> uh, moved by Director Miller, seconded by Director Jakes. Uh, Director Lee. Yes. Director Ortiz. Yes. Director Jakes. Yes. Director Miller. Yes. Director Silva. Yes. Chairman Barkley. Yes. Uh, the motion passed with six yes votes. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.